Welcome to the MLOps Live webinar series. We're on session number 23, and we're going to be talking about MLOps for Gen AI. My name is Sahar. I'm the VP of Marketing at Iguazio, and it's a pleasure to see so many of you here with us today. For those who are joining us for the first time, the MLOps Live webinar series is a place where we talk about real world implementation. We take data science from theory into practice, and we focus on different aspects of MLOps in every session. Today, we're gonna to tackle the super interesting topic of Gen AI, which has sparked everyone's imagination, created a lot of interest, but also a lot of uh, concerns and thoughts about risk and implementation in a very uh, efficient and uh, effective way within the enterprise. And we're gonna to touch on all of that here today. So welcome, and we're super happy to have you here with us. It is my pleasure to introduce our speakers for today. I'm very excited to have with us Nayur Khan, who's a partner at Quantum Black, McKinsey's AI arm. Nayur leads everything MLOps. He has a lot of experience with clients, with different projects, and he'll be sharing that with us today, giving us an introduction to generative AI, talking about different approaches to generative AI. We also have a surprise speaker, uh, Mara Pometti, who we're delighted to have with us as well. Uh, Mara is an associate director at McKinsey and leads AI strategy and governance. She'll be showing us a practical implementation of Gen AI in the financial services space. And of course, we have our very own Yaron Haviv, co-founder and CTO at Iguazio, who will be talking about implementing Gen AI applications in real business environments and showing us a demo of MLOps for Gen AI with automation, orchestration, and everything you need to really succeed with Gen AI in the real uh, business environment. We'll be running two polls during these sessions. The polls are here to help us make the session more valuable for you, hear a little bit from you and your perspective. So please do fill those in. And we'll be taking questions throughout the session in the Q&A panel. So please do put those in. Uh, we'll have a dedicated time at the end where you can ask our speakers your questions and have an engaging conversation with them. So uh, with that, I will pass it over to Nayur to get us started. Thanks, Saha. Hey, folks. Let me just share my screen. Let me know um, when you can yep, see it. We can see it. You're good to go. Thanks. Fan Nick. Fantastic. So um, look, I, I don't have to introduce Gen AI um, to a lot of you folks. I mean, I'm hoping because of the news and what you've seen out there and what you've heard, like, I'm sure you probably already know what it is, but like, in a, I, I'll summarize a little bit in a short span of time, this technology has come along and we haven't seen this for probably a decade or so since, you know, the iPhone and before that, the internet. Um, that a technology has come along and really captivated our imagination. Um, starting like mid last year um, with Mid Journey and, and DALI tools that allow you to type text, simple text, but generate very compelling images. And then November or so last year, ChatGPT burst onto the scenes. Not a new version of a technology, there's been older versions of this, but burst on the scenes really moved from research to the public mainstream and really captivate our imagination on one side, but also sparked off a, a, an almost revolution of new technologies around generative AI from the Microsofts and the Googles. I would also argue on top of all of this, open source has really democratized that tech and really captivated and, and helped with this flywheel effect of new innovation and new innovation, is, especially in this space. Um, I took an account a few days ago and there's 140 open source large language models available already. And I'm focusing on large language models and generative AI is a little bit bigger than that, but just from that perspective, and there's new ones that are appearing every week. So it's an incredibly exciting space, ex incredibly exciting time. Now, some of the headlines have been incredibly important, uh, amazing. Um, ChatGPT hit hundred million users in three months. We haven't ever seen that before, not, um, um, not with anything. Um, winning prizes or photography competitions, writing books. Um, I'm not sure if anyone's um, listened to the fake Drake, but it's really, really good. It's really, really good. Um, passing exams. So huge amounts of headlines that are just seem bewildering, especially to where we were a year ago. And because of that, we're also seeing this flywheel effect of companies really leaning into the technology and um, enhancing their product suites. Microsoft announcing that this generative AI technology uh, will be embedded into Windows or Office, co-pilots, if you like, inside this technology. Google have done exactly the same across their suite. Adobe through Photoshop and some of their other tools, they've done it. But it's not just those tools that we use every day and, and getting these co-pilots. Morgan Stanley, Salesforce, Walmart, Amazon, 
the list goes on of companies that are doubling down on this technology and, and using it in a way to enhance what they're doing today. Now, with everything, and as Sahar's mentioned, there's excitement on one side, but there's also balancing the, the risk. So it's being bold with the innovation, but also responsible. And I think we always have to do that. We'll touch a little bit on some of the responsibility elements um, in this webinar. Now, I'm also super proud to talk about our research in this area. We published this a few weeks ago, the, the economic potential that we see as, as McKinsey as Quantum Black um, for this particular technology, um, up to 4.4 trillion annual global productivity benefits. Um, so there's a, a huge potential here for organizations to really, really benefit from this technology. And this is in areas like marketing and sales, software engineering, which I'm super excited about. We'll, we'll talk a little bit about that. Customer operations or product R&D. Now, and this is across all industries, but look, I want to caveat and I want to pause a little bit. This is not about replacing jobs and we need to be the grown up sometimes in the room with this. This is literally about giving ourselves superpowers across these different areas to focus on the creative human tasks that we want to focus on and the boring mundane tasks we can give to these kind of tools. Now we're seeing four use case types or broad use case archetypes that are being developed. Um, and I'm going to try and summarize it here, but one is that if you're into a Marvel or you're, you're into um, that kind of Tony Stark, he had Jarvis, this kind of virtual expert, to, something to kind of, you know, backwards and forwards with, to summarize stuff, to grab insights, to play with ideas, to have a problem solving sessions with. So there's, there's an area around concession, around virtual expert. The second is around customer engagement. So rather than doing it on segments, doing personalized customer engagement one for one with a potential, with a co-pilot intelligent chatbots um, versus what we, we have today, really to have that really interactive, but very personal type conversations. Coding, which I'm super excited about, like tools to alongside in your ID to help you generate code and something that get rid of some of that boring boilerplate code, something else does it for you, but also prototype, document, translate. There's a whole host of different things here that the technology can really help. And something I'm really paying attention to, especially around data privacy is around synthetic data generation. It's, but huge amounts of opportunity here. And finally, co-generation. Um, I think we've all used this uh, in some form or fashion, but be able to specify, look, here's, here's five bullet points. Can you generate me an email? Or can you generate me a document, a presentation even? Um, again, not to replace what we do, but to really augment and get, help us get closer to what we want to do so we can focus on the creative human element. So super, super cool um, number of use cases. Now, one of the things um, in a lot of my conversations, especially over the last few months is like, Naya, how do, how do we get going? Or what are the ways that we can adopt, adopt this technology and get going and test it out and validate it? And I would um, split it down to three broad ways. There, there, are, you know, diff, um, uh, there are subtle differences between them. One is you could just call, it a, call an API, whether the API is a commercial or open source large language model. And I'm gonna focus on that because it's the easiest one to drive into. The other um, use cases are, are just as, uh, as valid. But this is really where you take a prompt, a question, something that you write a question in and you pass some context to it and ask these kind of models to give me a response back. The second is around, well, okay, look, that works great, but I, I need something a bit more. I need something that has a bit more of my domain um, in, inside it. So maybe I, I need to pre-trade, take one of these models, but then fine tune it with my, and add my additional data. So this is much more complex and much more harder to do, but organizations are, are doing this where they want something slightly different from the large language model and they want their own proprietary data with inside it. The third is probably the hardest, but we have seen this happen, which is it's all great and fine, but I don't want to use something that's done by someone else. I want to build it from scratch for myself because I want to control what data goes inside it, not just only from the public source, but also um, my own proprietary. Bloomberg did this uh, a few months ago and they published a paper and they called it um, their large language model Bloomberg GPT. So it's a fascinating read. I'm going to double click a little bit into one as an example of a use case of how companies can get going. I know Yaron later will talk about much more complex way of doing this uh, with some of the other tools we have. Now I'll caveat this entire section with um, this one quote I took from Steve Jobs. So it's not mine, it's from Steve Jobs, but Start with the problem, start with the customer experience, work your way back then to the tech. I cannot emphasize this enough. Like what's the problem you're trying to solve? Is this a problem? How are you gonna measure it? How are you gonna improve someone's, what, uh, someone's lives? And then work your way back towards the tech that applies. Mara will double click a lot into this and that human-centered design thinking approach. So um, I'm, I'm gonna whiz through this a little bit, but 
what is the kind of technology pieces that you need to kind of get going? And this is based on if I want to call an API. So one, you're going to start to need some kind of environment. And I'm going to argue here that, look, you're going to need DevOps and DevSecOps practices embedded. So you're going to need that for the infrastructure, whether that's cloud or uh, on-premise. And when I talk about Dev, DevOps, DevSecOps, I'm talking about the dev tools around source control, CI, CD, where you store your assets, how you monitor, how you do vulnerability scanning, config, secrets, et cetera, et cetera. Then you're going to need some kind of app that you're going to be building. Um, and let's use that as an example for this example. Um, and here I would argue, look, follow good software engineering practices, follow like the 12 factor app guidelines. There's just around how do you build modular, really um, um, scalable type applications. So just have something in, in place where you're following these two things as a baseline. Then you're going to have to think about, OK, what model do I want to use? And there's a whole bunch of criteria that you need to factor into. Like each model has out there, and I'm talking about the public ones, like Azure, OpenAI, Google, Kahir, there's a, there's a bunch of others. You're going to have to look at trade-offs between cost, accuracy, token limits are different between the, the, all of them, speed, privacy, and so on and so forth. And there's a bunch of risks that you need to evaluate. But once you've done that, think about inside your back end of your app, well, how are you going to orchestrate these calls to these APIs going backwards and forwards? Are you going to use um, custom code, which is valid, and you can just use simple calls to APIs? Or are you going to use one of these new frameworks which are appearing, which are getting better and better every day, like Langchain or Llama Index? Those are Python. But there's other, other frameworks as well and other tools like Ruby or, or Node.js. The third I would ask you to think about is where do you store these prompt templates? Like these are the questions that you're going to be asking these large language models. Don't store it inside your application. Externalize it because these are going to change. So store them somewhere where you're going to have version control and you're going to be able to adjust them. It's going to be important. And these are kind of the learnings that we're seeing as well. And then the fourth thing, think about your cost management here. And I'm not talking about infrastructure. Um, calling these APIs, the costs will rack up very, very quickly. So think about that FinOps angle. It's going to be important as you start going through this cycle. The next thing, you, you probably want to think about, OK, I'm asking a, a general large language model something, but I want to put my own context into it. So I want to put my own context into the prompt. So think about where do you get that context from? And there's various ways of doing it. Now, there is, the flavor of the month is, look, you need to have a vector database. But I would argue that's not always the case. Maybe you've got a customer 360 and you just want some customer information. So you can use that. You might have a traditional database or a warehouse that you have normal information about, a customer or something, whatever your use case is, you can use that, maybe a graph database. If you go down the vector route, which is absolutely valid, um, if you've got a large uh, amount of documents that you want to look for, then you could do that. But there's going to be a lot more infrastructure and in how you po populate that vector database that you're going to have to think about. Something that we've been seeing a lot is validation on the prompts. And what do I mean by that? That, that prompts start to start to drift. Um, and it's something that has worked a few months ago suddenly stops working or, or not, not working like it used to. Responses are not the same. So think about how do you build those um, um, validation for prompt drifts. And this is important um, because over time, um, you're going to have to figure out what are the tools to validate what's coming back from these large language models. Um, I would also argue on top of all of this, think about how do you guard against um, the, or validate the prompt going in and what the user is doing. Like, so that around prompt injection or prompt misuse, and this, this is around, well, you've built a use case, maybe for, it's for customer service, as an example. You want to avoid people asking um, your technology that you put in place, or how do I bake a cake? Um, it's probably not the best use of your technology. And you want to kind of guard against, look, that's not the intent of this technology. Finally, think about um, uh, caching. And, and this is really around improving performance of the user, because the time it takes to make these calls to a large language model come back might be expensive. So think about how do you speed things up because someone's asked the same question or, or many people are asking the same question. So caching it and it's just to improve performance, but also avoid the additional cost and complexity that goes on. And then I would also argue, well, look, once you've got something working and you've got a prototype up and running um, and it, it's kind of working for you, think about maybe some of the open source models that are out there. That, that some of them are just as good in many cases. And again, depending on your use case, Maybe you don't want to pay so much for an external service because it's a simple chatbot that you need for, 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 for you users or customers. Um, and some of the ones like for Meta or, or, or Stanford are really, really good. Even Databricks' Dolly um, are, are really cool. So look, I'm, I'm going to uh, wrap this up by just summarizing. And these kind of guidelines of get, how do you get going? Think about the application itself and follow good 12-factor app guidelines around source control, not hard coding configuration, keeping the environments the same, et cetera, et cetera. 
follow the DevOps and DevSecOps type practices, CICD, infrastructure's code, shift left on the security, protect your secrets. These APIs have um, and secrets, so keep them safe somewhere that it's not checked into, into in source control. Think about how you do vulnerability scanning. Um, and then that comes with its general ops challenges. And this is just DevOps and DevSecOps, but application performance, API limits, some of these external services have API limits. Think about how do you defend against that and resiliency. But then there is a, a new space um, that you're going to have to think about. So on the model itself, there's going to be a bunch of criteria you're going to have to think about. And this will change over time depending on your use case. But trade-off cost and speed, accuracy, token limits, data privacy, whether you want to do proprietary open source, there's a bunch of things you're going to have to consider where you start. But that might not be where you are tomorrow. And there's a reason for this, is that the space is changing so much. Things are getting better and better. New options are being available. So think about your model selection criteria. But then that will move on to you know, the LLM ops challenges, if that's a, if it's a new term. Um, think about how do you guard against that prompt injection of prompt misuse. It's going to be really, really important. Think also about the prompt templates, where you store them and make sure there's version controls. Think about your token limits. Different large language models have different limits. So think about how do you stay inside that. Think about how do you protect your sensitive data from leaking? And what do you need to build in that place that before um, you send off to these large language models and then prompt drift I think we've covered now finally around API costs again it'll rack up so think about the FinOps angle on this um, and the, I've touched on this already build something in such a way that you can swap things in and out especially these models because they will change and it's really good to just experiment with other types of models especially open source there are other considerations to to kind of like drive into around bias and fairness IP inaccuracies and the regulations around this but I think this gives you a general framework of, look, you can get going today. It's not so much cost. You can get up and going really quickly, but there's a bunch of things you're going to have to think about. Now, with that, um, I'm whizzing through it, so I'm happy to answer questions on the q and I'm going to hand over to Mara, who's going to talk now more about what I framed up earlier, is that human-centered approach. What's the problem you're solving, and what's a good way of solving that without um, um, over-engineering and just trying to apply technology to a problem if it's not a problem? Thank you very much, Anir. Um, let me share my screen. And thank you so much for the lead. Um, in fact, uh, um, today I, I want exactly to talk to you about uh, human-centered AI practices. Um, actually, not just by talking, but uh, uh, showing you a concrete example where with the team, uh, I embedded uh, uh, human-centered AI practices in the AI development. And as Nia said before, uh, generative AI um, is bringing uh, um, a lot of economic opportunities, but uh, again, uh, everything uh, comes back uh, to solving the right problems. AI really returns uh, ROI and economic value only if uh, it is applied where it matters to people. And this was the core that uh, led the entire creation of this new solution um, that basically transforms the way that banks uh, interact uh, and engage with their customers. So we built, uh, by combining a pipeline of machine learning models uh, and uh, LLMs, so generative models, we were able to create, uh, to basically uh, go away from the all the um, mainstream actually uh, segmentation cost concept, uh, customer segmentation concept, uh, and be able to create a solution to generate custom uh, messages tailored to each bank uh, bank's customer. And so we created thousands of thousands of different messages targeting uh, the different needs, uh, um, habits, uh, and uh, uh, history of these customers with the bank. So for example, let's look at uh, Lucilla for it. Um, a customer relationship manager might want to understand better who Lucilla is to understand how to engage with her, what are their pain points, what are her pain points, their challenges with the bank, her challenges in receiving the messages with the bank. And so we develop the machine learning um, tools and the generative models to immediately generate a brief summary of Lucilla's story just to see what uh, her data or information can tell us about uh, um, her lifestyle. 
And after understanding that, uh, we can better engage with Lucilla. And so we generated these uh, different uh, sequence of messages that uh, basically um, use the machine learning models to um, provide information to inform the content generated by the uh, LLM. And so um, we know um, that uh, the best channel for Lucilla is an email, that the best time to engage with her is the evening. Um, we know what is the best product that we can recommend her based on her needs. And so we can immediately generate an email for Lucilla by targeting each word, the tone, uh, and how we engage with her based on who we should. Uh, for example, the generation, I mean, the, the, the generative model can create this email by saying that uh, this uh, gold credit card that we recommend uh, is music to Lucilla's ears because uh, she's a singer. So we really created a different uh, type of messages, always related to Lucilla um, life. For example, um, if Lucilla doesn't engage with the first email, we can nudge her. We can create a second communication, a second message, this time a push notification. And we can approach Lucilla this time by leveraging her love for shoes because we have her spending transactions data. We know what she likes. And so in this way, we were able to create this solution that is really centered on customer needs. And we did a lot of work by embracing human-centered practices that span across uh, design thinking, customer research, SME research, SMEs interviews, customer interviews. So we collected uh, all the um, insights uh, coming from the understanding of what our customer needs and customer challenges with uh, how bank engage with them. And basically we translated the uh, human requirements into technical requirements to inform the craft of the prompting engineering um, that uh, eventually um, inform how um, the model, uh, what outcomes the model should return. And based on that, uh, we uh, utilized also the human-centered approach to assess the potential risks and effects that the AI might have on people and organizations, in this case, the bank. Um, so basically, we utilize some human-centered frameworks, uh, I mean, benchmarking frameworks, to embed the responsible AI concept into the development practices. And we created custom guardrails to make sure that each message that is being sent to customer is reliable and trustworthy. And so to to track um, metrics like uh, the toxicity, bias and stereotypes, uh, harmfulness. We custom make these uh, uh, guardrails uh, that is basically made of other um, algorithms on top uh, of uh, the algorithms already existing for the solution that basically check the trustworthiness of each word, each sentence generated by the model. And we expanded that process by having uh, a human validation. Um, and so basically we also validated uh, um, the, the messages while uh, the data scientists were uh, developing the prompts and uh, the algorithms to check uh, against to these uh, selected metrics. And so if you imagine to switch off uh, suddenly these guard rays, you see that the message uh, goes completely crazy. It starts um, addressing uh, the customer in, in an appropriate way, like lovely lady. Um, it starts giving and providing financial advice, which is uh, illegal in the UK, um, and other examples. Um, so the human-centered approach is really a way to guide the AI development and especially align humans and organization expectations to um, the uh, AI's outcome. And by Starting first by aligning these, uh, the outcomes of the model and the human expectation, we were able to create a solution that really solves for human needs and therefore generates value. And now I would love to pass it back to Sar for the poll. Thank you so much, Mara. That was fantastic and super, super interesting. And thank you, Nayur, for that comprehensive overview. 
Uh, we're going to pause now to take a quick poll, but before that, I just wanted to mention I'm seeing a lot of questions in the chat. So we are recording the session and we'll be sending the recording to you over email tomorrow. So you should all receive that um, and have it with you for future reference. All right, so let me just share with you our first poll. Once the computer decides to play ball, here we go. Okay, so we want to hear from you. What is your familiarity level with Gen AI? Uh, we're going to launch the poll now, and uh, please do let us know. Have you heard about it but haven't tried it yet? Probably all of you have heard about it by now. Have you tried mainstream applications like ChatGPT? Are you working on your own Gen AI use case? Have you fine-tuned your own model? Or do you have Gen AI apps already running in production? And of course, we'll be sharing the results of the polls with you at the end of the session. We know that's always uh, very interesting to see what others are, are doing and uh, where they are on their Gen AI journey. So I see that you're still filling it out. We'll give it just another two, three seconds for anyone else who wants to participate. Okay, fantastic. Thank you so much. I would now like to pass it on to Yaron, who's gonna take you to the implementation phase and beyond. Yaron, over to you. Well, thank you, uh, Saar. Um, okay, uh, can you also allow me, let me share my uh, video, but I'll... Uh, I'll start with the slide. So anyway, thanks uh, for Nayur and Mara. Those uh, those were uh, great presentations. Uh, I'm going to speak now more on the operationalization of uh, Gen AI stacks and also follow up with a demo from MLOps for, for Gen AI. But before we start, uh, let's talk about the main challenges that we, we've identified. You know, the first one is, and I think some of those actually appear right now in the, in the question, the first one is around cost and performance. It's usually both because uh, it could be very expensive on one end to train or tune a model. On the other, even to use an existing model, you have a, re a cost of every API invocation and so on. Uh, some application may actually require multiple invocations into the same uh, model you know, to refine and to adjust or maybe grab a bunch of uh, pages and content into the, the models. So it's becoming very expensive. The next challenge that everyone is talking about is risk, but we, we want to also talk about how to de-risk and uh, Mara showed us a, a great example of how we can uh, do that. And the third element, when you build things for production, not as a playing ground with some lang chain and so on, there are many different considerations. Some of them were covered by Nayur actually. Uh, then you need to start thinking about scale and uh, storing stuff in databases and and testing and validation and automation, all those things make things much harder in an LLM environment because of the requirement for scale and because of the all the unknowns and risks that are presented in. So, uh, but before we, we dive into the solution, so we talked about two different scenarios. One, uh, one approach is to use the model as is and just throw some data at it, ask it to summarize and refine and so on. Uh, the second, um, uh, approach is tuning the model, taking an existing model and tuning it to a specific corpus of data. Uh, there are advantages and disadvantages to each of the approaches. On one end, prompt engineering, uh, everything is working. You just need to throw some calls into an API. So you don't need to train, you don't need to uh, build and have the data for the training. But on the other end, it's relatively slow compared to uh, tuning. Why? Because we need to feed uh, kilobytes of data on every request and and it takes uh, time and we also have those limits around tokens and so on. The other approach of fine tuning, we can essentially put the data into the model by tuning and teaching the model with new context. But at the same time, that means that we're building a model. Building a model means validating it and testing it and running training at scale with multiple GPUs and, and also bringing up the model 
on a serving endpoint, that means that we keep on paying for the infrastructure, for the compute, for the GPUs throughout the day. So there's probably a point where if you're making a, a dozen requests a day to an LLM, probably it will be very expensive to host your own. On the other end, if you're making many thousands of requests to the model throughout the day, maybe it'll actually be cheaper to tune a model. And, and also another point is that the open source models, if they're tuned with enough data, they can actually match in performance some of the bigger models that are way more expensive. So it really depends on the task. If the task is on a limited uh, corpus of data, for example, you want to create a virtual SME on a fixed set of, of pages of content, sometimes tuning will actually be a smaller and more agile uh, solution. Uh, the other sort of uh, side, uh, side gig around uh, fine tuning is the reinforced learning. So if I'm building my own uh, model, I need to validate it. And from time to time, I'll see that it's making mistakes and making some silly remarks. I need to take those label, that input and return it back into the system and make sure this doesn't happen again. So this is reinforced learning with human feedback. And obviously it adds complexity. We need human labelers and we need to build a pipeline for that and so on. So now, now if we're saying, okay, how do we build an entire solution? Like every MLOP solution, it comprises of four main components. The first component is the data, data ingestion, processing, and so on. The second one is essentially the training or tuning in our cases. Uh, we have the application pipeline, essentially getting the requests, you know, uh, prompting, uh, creating the prompts, uh, scoring the model, and so on. And we have the monitoring. A piece that needs to monitor that the solution actually is doing the right things and there's no toxicity, there's no bad sentiments, there's no uh, stupid answers, there's no hallucinations and so on. And in some cases, you're also creating labels which will be used for the reinforced learning and retuning. Uh, some people say, okay, I don't need to tune, so I just need to keep those three elements in my solution, that's okay. One important point is that you may have multiple models in many applications. This is a very simplistic approach of an application. Most applications that I've seen have few, several models throughout the pipeline. Like for example, the first step will we need to do some sort of classification and refinement of the, the question, not to mention maybe even speech to text. So this is one model or, or two models that are in the beginning. Maybe those models don't really need a very expensive uh, LLM. Maybe they could be that you could do classification with a much cheaper, faster uh, model. And then you may have other models for doing the LLM and maybe another model for examining the sentiments or the toxicity of the language, et cetera. So within a single pipeline, we may find ourselves uh, hitting multiple models and some of them may need to be trained and tuned. So that's an important uh, distinction. So we talked about all those different risks and uh, we, we kind of reiterate over those elements of fairness and bias. You know, we train data on something with a specific gender or a specific part of the population and then the model will start generating responses that are unfair. Uh, we have a lot of discussion in the industry around intellectual property and privacy. So uh, when you're training the model from uh, the entire corpus of the world, there may be even copyright issues that we've seen. Someone is, is uh, putting his stuff in GitHub and we're training the model and this thing leads to an answer. So there's a, a problem with who's uh, who owns the IP. Or if we're an organization, we train the data and we have some emails and maybe phone numbers or, or other private data. And this happens to go outside in the, in the responses. So it's another issue. Um, issues are toxicity. Again, we're training the model with lots of data from all over the world. Some of it is, is unfair or toxic and, uh, and so on. And you have all those other challenges. But the important point that those challenges could be mitigated. And the main way to mitigate those challenges is by making sure that on one end, we're training the model on the right data, on data that was clean and doesn't incorporate all of those elements in the training data. The model doesn't know want to invent stuff. It's essentially just taking the data that it was trained on and through some statistics spitting out answers. So if we make sure that when we train the data, we don't use the wrong data, that's the first thing. Uh, the second part we will do that is during the validation. After we, we created the model or use the model, we would just want to throw in a bunch of different scenarios at the model and see that it's essentially behaving uh, properly. 
There are also other places where we can control those things. One is in the real-time pipeline. We're getting the request. We can see that the request is not misused or the request is not toxic or even the response is not toxic or exposing us to various threats. And finally, the last point that we can monitor those is in the monitoring system. Sometimes you don't want to do it in the real-time pipeline because you're not really sure if it's toxic or not, you know, but you can uh, throw all the data into a monitoring system and later on show dashboards or maybe uh, do something or reinforce learning to fix the problem, et cetera. So there are ways to mitigate and all of those need to happen within your pipeline. So this is just an as example of, you know, everyone talks about data engineering in machine learning, but there's a lot of data engineering also in NLP and unstructured data. So this is just some examples of how you can take the data and you may want to break things to paragraph to make it more meaningful. You, you need to clean a lot of garbage from the data and carriage returns and URLs and hashtags and so on. So the model doesn't generate the wrong results. Uh, sometimes the data is duplicated or not organized properly. Maybe you have ads in the content that you want to just remove. Uh, you want to anonymize and you want to you know, remove emails, remove identities, remove uh, credit card numbers and so on. And there are other things like indexing and tokenization and in order to improve eventually the results. One of the things that we've done, by the way, in the demo that you're going to see is injecting tokens into the data that will essentially be able to check for, look for them in the response. And this way we know that the model wasn't hallucinating. It wasn't spitting out results which are not related to the training uh, or the tuning data set. So when we're talking about the, the training pipeline, essentially on the first part is preparing the data again. And the second part is taking the foundation model running distributed transfer learning. Why distributed? Those models usually fit into at least one GPU, if not some of those you know, need four or eight GPUs, the large models. When you train, you need at least 5X the number of GPUs just to be able to train or tune the model. So we'll, we'll need to essentially create a cluster, throw this uh, job across the cluster, distribute it, build a model. Maybe the tuning won't take a lot, a lot of time, maybe 10 minutes, half an hour but still we need the horizontal scaling to fit all the, the model. Once we build the, the tuned model, we need to do things like testing, evaluation. There are many different techniques today to optimize models and compress them using different uh, methods. And this way the shrink the final model so it will fit into less infrastructure. That's part of reducing the cost. And we want to do a lot of stress testing, testing in the application domain, testing of deployment, testing of throwing lots of requesting that response, throwing tests around the security and risk and so on. So we have all those challenges around the complexity of building those pipelines, we have the kind of challenges around distributed learning and training and testing and, and continuous deployment. Again, we want to make changes because we have reinforced learning. We need to upgrade versions. We need to deploy them to production. So the solution is really building things around more continuous flow with CICD and, and MLOps, and we're going to show you how, how we do that. Uh, the next important pipeline is the application pipeline. If you Even if you don't do uh, tuning, if you just use prompts, the application pipeline may be very complicated. This is a very simplistic way of looking at it. So, you know, we take the, pro the request and then we need to read the state maybe from a database or we need to uh, read some knowledge from a vector database or a, a document database and enrich the content and then do some prompt engineering. Uh, in this stage, again, we may have a bunch of additional steps like refinement is, is used a lot in order to make sure that the, the way we ask the question is more comprehensive, more complete. Other things like classification, maybe I need to uh, read different types of documents that sit in different databases. So I need some classifiers say, Oh, this question is about, I don't know, product. This question is about processes. So this model is going to handle this and the other model is going to handle the other thing. So this, these are very important because if we, uh, we know better how to zoom into the question and pull the right uh, knowledge into the model, we'll get better results. Uh, a lot of people just index everything in the vector database and just throw everything at the model what most of those frameworks like Langchain and others do, they'll pick the you know three or two, five 
uh, more most matching paragraphs. Now, if you're just looking at the entire data and choosing three or five uh, pages or paragraphs, they may not be the right paragraph. So if you know within the document that there is a specific topic and you can combine things like key, well, key value search or labels with associated search and vector indexing, you can actually make sure that you're taking just the right content into the LLM and you'll get much better answer. So I think people are still very naive. Everyone builds his own bot and it, it, it acts nicely, but in order to get to the level of production and accuracy you're looking for, you'll find that there's a lot of tuning to do. There's a lot of engineering to apply to make it uh, really work. So what are our main guidelines for, for you is first try and leverage existing LLMs. And there are many different options here. You also need to keep your options open because we'll see more and more LLMs uh, being covered on a weekly basis. Uh, you need to personalize them using your proprietary data. So you need to do a lot of massaging of the data and preparations. Uh, implement measures to reduce risk. There are many different things that we could, we could do. We showed some of them, cleaning the data, adding guardrails, adding human feedback, and so on. You need to build a scalable, automated, and continuous de deployment and development environment. Uh, and also keep your design flexible to embrace change. And why is that? Again, like every week, every uh, months, you'll see new frameworks coming that will be magnitude better than the old ones. So if you just go and bet everything on, let's say, OpenAI or Azure or SageMaker or Google or Langchain or so on, and then something else comes in, then you may, may be stuck with a certain a specific choice. So try and, and build the design. For example, all the things that we talk about data, there are things that will be reused across every changing technology. Like if you change the LLMs, you still need to prepare the data properly. So we suggest doubling down on those components that are harder to do, but also more sustainable. So one of the things that we, we wanna show you is how we built all of that using Emma Run and uh, leveraging the ability of Emma Run to build serverless functions that are distributed and can use a lot of uh, CPUs and GPUs. Uh, and automate all this data engineering and tuning and, and all that. Second thing that we want to show is how we can build a real-time pipeline with some complex logic in it and rapidly deploy that. And also we have other things in the in the demo. So let me... Yvonne, this is fascinating, fascinating stuff and super in-depth. Thank you so much. Unfortunately, we're out of time. I think we're going to need to have another whole webinar around this. And we do have a lot of questions. So I'd love to open it up uh, to Q&A. And invite so maybe I'll here. just point people to the demo. By the way, the demo is documented in, uh, you have a Git repo, MRN slash demo LLM tuning. It also has a recorded video of the demo. And essentially the demo shows how to uh, go do the, the full pipeline of data engineering, tuning, evaluation, testing, and then uh, the real-time pipeline, you know, this is all with monitoring and with everything. And then the real-time pipeline and eventually just builds uh, a full chatbot application that is tuned on specific sense. It's trained on the MLOps live corpus of, of data. So it essentially knows about Drift and MRUN and MLOps and so on. And if you'd like Back to see a demo of this, just uh, ping us, uh, we shared the link for the MLOps Live uh, Slack community, just here in the chat. By the way, I'm loving what's going on in the chat. Everyone's connecting on LinkedIn, it's fantastic. Uh, so just ping us in the community if you'd like to see a demo, we'll be happy to set up another session to go a little bit more in depth. Uh, but thank you so much, Yohan. This is really, really fascinating stuff. Uh, we have some great questions in the Q&A. So I'd like to invite our speakers back and we can start to tackle a couple of these because this is generating a lot of interest. Um, so the first question is for you, Nayur. What is the key difference between fine-tuning and uh, embedding a foundational model? Yeah, no, it's, it's a good question. I think Yaron has already answered this um, in, in his section. Um, Yaron, I mean, you just covered this, right? The... Yeah, I think so. Uh... So I, I, I mean, this is, this is pre-answered. Like if, if that's still a question, do ask again later, but I, I think we covered, we covered the, this and Yaron went deep into this. What's the difference between fine tuning and 
embedding into a foundation. So maybe model. just in a sentence to kind of summarize for the so, so, are so one so so it, I think we're confusing two different things, but like for the fine tuning is I'm taking an existing model, but maybe I want something with my my domain knowledge. So maybe I want some additional data and I want to change and make that that model more domain specific. Um, the analogy I would give is imagine you have a, a dog and you've trained that dog and you brought that dog up and to do a certain thing. But if you want to fine tune that dog, you want to make that dog into a police dog, you're doing it for a specific purpose, a specific domain. So it's slightly different is you're using your data, your domain data to train uh, on top or fine tune a model for a specific purpose or specific domain. Embedding is really, look, I'm taking some body of knowledge of, of data um, and maybe I'm going to embed that in somehow into a, a prompt and I can use a vector database to, to your um, um points or I can use um, additional information. But what I'm doing is I'm using a prompt to embed information. I hope Thank that you so much. That's makes fantastic. sense. Um, another question is around uh, privacy. Is there a privacy issue or data leaking risk with custom models that utilize proprietary or internet public data? Who wants to take this one? So, so I'll take a just a quick set. Look, I think whatever you're building is obviously have your legal team involved and look carefully at the terms and reference of whatever models you're using and whatever their terms of reference is. There has been cases where um, um, chat information has leaked. And so I, I would always weigh up the pros and cons. And this is what I meant when you do your model selection about what are what is what is um, the, the thing that you want to get out of it. If it's privacy and your privacy is, is the most important thing for you and about your data not leaking, then this is also why I showed you can go from a proof of concept which uses a public API where you're not using any kind of private information to something that uses uh, an internal uh, hosted uh, large language model. Fantastic. Thank you. Um, a question here about vision use cases. If we have any architectural or similar advice for vision use cases, I'm, I assume it's a computer vision, maybe something we can share later with the audience. So Yaren, do you, do you want to take this one? I mean, generally at the high level, architecture would be the same. It's just a different, you know, one kind of front end and Mara can talk a lot more about kind of from the use case point of view. Two architecturally very, but the prompts are slightly different and the, the it's not you don't have the variety of these large language models you have specific vision models that are available and this is um it's a much more narrow field but it's exciting in in that response but i think architecturally a lot of the similar things that we talked about are pretty much the same yaron if any, any yeah i think that potential application wise there's more scenarios for tuning a language model for documents and so on because i think training a, a vision model is much, is much harder um so, and there are less applications for building your own uh, vision model, you know, beyond the traditional deep learning and, and customizing models to, to understand specific images. Um, so, so I think a lot more challenge around the, the NLP ones. Absolutely. A uh, question here for Mara. Can you talk about how the guardrails were implemented in the example that you shared? Yeah, sure. Um, I can talk about especially the, the approach that we used uh, because we started from that right uh, on, on the point of human-centered uh, approaches. Um, so we started by selecting, really thinking through what uh, risks we wanted to avoid in terms of uh, biases, transparency, explainability, fairness, and all the dimensions that uh, make up responsible AI. And we think through about the first, the metrics to really capture um, some benchmarking that then we used to um, generate, I mean, create the models um, to basically check with a rating um, that we deliberately um, decided um, if the content generated in that case, the message was uh, um, compliant with uh, the metrics that uh, um, we use for the monitoring. Um, and so um, I have uh, um, the data scientists developed this uh, analytic engine on top of uh, um, exactly, as I said before, the machine learning pipeline and the generative AI models that we use. Um, and, uh, and then the metrics basically guided the understanding of the reliability and trustworthiness of each model. And yeah, maybe I'll take Sarah the next question from Thomas. There is a question around the use of resources 
in terms of data computation power and so on. Uh, I think there's a big challenge right now on computation resources. Uh, in the lab, we have scripts that try to get A100s in, uh, from AWS, because you can't just get a GPU, even if you're willing to pay for it. And we see that in the NVIDIA recent finance uh, numbers, uh, their stock jumps 30%. Uh, I think what we need to, to be really mindful into essentially uh, not wasting GPU resources if we're training, just do it for the sake of, for the time scope of, uh, of the training. Uh, if, uh, if you want to train your own LLM from scratch, uh, we're talking about tens of thousands of GPUs. That's like, uh, you know, things like GPT, it's uh, like one training spin is about $10 million, okay? If you have such amount in the bank, that's okay. If not, you can go for fine tuning. And um, you know, even this demo, I think the training job was about six minutes across uh, 16 uh, GPUs or something. Do the math, it's not too expensive. And if we decommission all the resources immediately using sort of the elasticity of, of the Kubernetes and the GPU allocation and all of that, by the way, they were trained on Tesla CPUs, which you can probably get in Amazon, like day 100s are very scarce. And there are some uh, technology that we're using in the demo around being able to leverage those cheaper uh, GPUs. So that's another thing that allows you to reduce the, the overall cost. But again, keep things very elastic, be able to distribute on cheaper uh, components, decommission uh, when you don't need it. Fantastic. And again, use the smaller models if you don't need the really big ones. 100%. And there's another question related to that. What are the ways to combine traditional machine learning models, cross-selling, upselling models with LLMs? Maybe you might want to go in kind of a combination. Ma Mario, I mean, that's basically what you were doing, right? So maybe you, you can. Absolutely. Um, so again, um, I'm, I'm talking from the, the, the approach uh, mostly, um, which is needed uh, to, to implement, uh, to really guardrail uh, machine learning models in terms of uh, biases uh, and, and fairness. Um, so like in our case, uh, uh, we immediately spotted uh, that uh, there could have been uh, that issue, especially um, in terms of allocation harm in how um, the, the content of the messages is uh, um, targeted to specific customers and how there might be the risk because of biases to basically create financial barriers um, for uh, people to access these specific products or recommendations. Um, and so we really um, started the thinking of what type of biases and stereotypes could have been uh, um, embedded in the models. Um, and uh, from there, exactly um, creating uh, custom-made uh, algorithms that uh, basically um, can give that layer of um, explainability to prevent uh, um, problem, I mean, possible potential biases uh, and of the models, of the machine learning models. While the generative AI uh, thing is a completely different beast, um, which we exactly created some custom metrics uh, specifically for that, um, to really create a, a layer, an additional layer on top of the, the layer put on the machine learning, uh, just specifically to address the different needs that the generative models have in terms of biases, stereotypes, hallucination, and toxicity. Thanks, Mar. It's definitely a complex world. It introduces a lot of new kind of uh, things to think about. Um, there's a question from Raul about model monitoring. When monitoring performance of prompt engineered systems, what would the best practices be in establishing thresholds to trigger a new iteration with new prompts in the ML lifecycle? Nayur, maybe you want to take this one? Yeah, I, I can. I think look, this is a this is a place where it's um, I think it's evolving, and you know, right now we also we always have a human in the loop. We're always continuously evaluating some of this, uh, what's coming back from the prompt, and what we put as a here's what we think should be a really good but um, version of a response. And this is why I said there's I had a validation, but I left it as a blank box. There is a tool called Guardrails. There's some other ones that are available, getting better and better, and they kind of use a a way of evaluating some of these responses. 
Um, but it's an evolving space. And I don't think anyone's got the answer. Like, I'd be, I'd be surprised if someone tells me, like, there's a tool and it, it just works 100% of the time. This is six months to nine months old technology um, versus other type of testing tools that we've had for decades. Um, so I would expect this, this space to change. What I have seen and having spoken to many, many organizations um, all around the world, on like some are actually asking other LLMs, like, is this a good response? Like, so there's, a, there's almost like a chaining backwards and forwards and you get a response back of the one that you think and then you go and ask someone else. And it's almost like a, 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 a check base and a, a challenger type of response, way of, of thinking. Um, there is no, there is, I, I would love to give you an answer, but I'd, I'd say right now, experiment, experiment, experiment what works for you, but always the human, <laughs> um, you cannot be the human at the moment to validate some of this stuff. Yeah, maybe just to add again, there are, there are some metrics like perplexity and even the things that Mara showed that are done pre-generating the message could also be done post-generating the message. And there again, there are other metrics mainly around creating an NLP model that analyzes the response, uh, maybe to see that the actual we're talking about specific topic or maybe the, the answer really answers the, the question that was asked. So you can essentially build other models to examine your model. And Johan, there's also a question here about addressing scalability and performance challenges, which is more related to the MLOps kind of portion. Can you say a couple of words about that? In terms of... Uh, In so, general, scalability and performance, how would you um, so advise people to, to think about that? Again, the, the training or even tuning a model requires lots of uh, computation, and, uh, maybe for a, a short period of time. So you need distributed frameworks. Uh, currently, there are two main distributed frameworks that are used in this uh, space. One is, is called Horvod, and it sort of interacts with the uh, uh, high-speed MPI layer for messaging underneath. Uh, so that's one mechanism of essentially running distributed training over TensorFlow or PyTorch and so on. Uh, the other uh, popular framework in the NLP space is Ray, which is uh, also distributed Python, if you will, that allows you to distribute the workload and shard your uh, your model, whether it's based on the, the data or based on the, the model scaling across multiple computation. Uh, there's also frameworks addressing the same for the serving because, you know, serving something like a GPT-3 is probably between four to eight GPUs. So if, uh, if you're preparing your budget, you know, put some, I think it's like uh, $20,000, $30,000 for serving a model a month. Okay, so prepare your budget. Uh, if you're taking something smaller like uh, Open Lama or or the other ones that may perform well if you if you teach them enough uh, knowledge, it may actually be only one GPU or two. So that that has impact. But there are frameworks that know how to partition your model into multiple GPUs. There's a lot of research on that space um, around how to build a distribution more efficiently, both for the serving and the training uh, aspects. Fantastic. So we're nearing the end of our time. We'll just take one more question and we'll kind of wrap it up. Uh, there's a good one here about the importance of collaboration and communication between data scientists and DevOps teams uh, in Gen AI and MLOps in general. Uh, Mara, do you want to say a couple words on that? Yeah, absolutely. I, I think it's the core um, of the example that I showed you that we built, but it's the core in general in every team. Um, it, it's really about uh, aligning on intent before stepping into the implementation of this use case, right? Like Nayar said at the beginning, it's, the core should always be uh, the problem that we are trying to solve. And that alignment basically uh, does the glue work between the different souls that compone eventually a work stream, like the data science, the data engineers, um, the designers, the strategies uh, that bring the human center um, view um, into the, the collaboration collaboration with the team. And so um, I think that eventually what made also that solution so particular and so successful, it was the collaboration between all these different talents working together. And we never worked with separated work streams, right? We always, uh, we were always together in every single meeting, in every single design thinking workshop, really shared every time our collective knowledge and learnings. Um, I, for example, went a lot of times into the Jupyter notebooks of my colleagues, data scientists, to see how they were developing the 
prompts, right? For example, to better understand what was needed from a customer perspective and customer research. So I guess uh, that's the, the real success and something that we should more and more embrace, especially now in this generative AI era that uh, we are facing. Absolutely. Collaboration is so key to all of this, especially in such an emerging field. Um, that's wonderful. So at this point, I just want to thank everyone so much uh, for being with us for your questions. There are a couple questions that we didn't get a chance to answer live, but we do invite you to join the MLOps live community. We'll share the link in the chat again, and we'll be happy to address any questions that were kind of left unanswered and continue the conversation there. Um, like I mentioned, we'll send all the collaterals to you after the session. I did promise to share the poll results. We only got a chance to do one because of the overwhelming interest in this topic. So I'll just share that very quickly and I hope that you can all see. 43% um, of uh, the participants said that they've tried mainstream applications like ChatGPT, which is not surprising. As Nayur mentioned earlier, a million users in five days. I mean, probably a lot of you have tried uh, ChatGPT and, and other applications. 31% uh, said that they are working on their own Gen AI use case. 11% are here to really learn about Gen AI. They've heard about it, but haven't tried it yet. 8% have their own Gen AI apps running in production, which is very advanced. Um, and 6% have fine-tuned their own model. So it sounds like we have a lot of expertise in this group, and we'd love to continue the conversation on MLOps Live, uh, like I mentioned earlier. Um, that's it. Thank you so much for being here with us. Thanks, Nayur, Yaron, and Mara for the fantastic insights and presentations. And uh, we are looking forward to seeing you on the next one. Thank you. Thank you so much. Bye.